uh, what a surprise and delight it was for me to actually be able to call the mayor and congratulate him and to say, when are you coming to town? And I said, I'm there now. And he said, what are you doing and I don't know about it? And I said, I'm speaking tomorrow. And he said, can I come by? And I said, you're kidding, right? And he said, I'll be there. What time? So he, he um, uh, I commend you and congratulate you on electing him. Um, he's been a great visionary. He's about solving um, problems and solutions. And he's about doing it from the bottom and the grassroots up. And I can't thank him enough for... Um, taking the commitment and uh, going back into public service the way that he goes back into public service. And I think it goes right into all, all of our stories, yours and mine. And what I want to talk about is about my journey and the journey of other people that I've met along the way. And then open it up to all of you because I want to hear your stories too. So my story, as the mayor began to allude to, when I was uh, two years old, I was the seventh of eight children. And um, my mother gave birth to my youngest sister. And he, my father was a cross-country truck driver, and he went to unload a truck and never came back. And for two years, my mother tried valiantly to raise us. With not much success, she had a nervous breakdown. And we essentially, and particularly my older siblings, began to get in a lot of trouble. And we, we became wards of the court. My mom was faced with this decision of either breaking us up into individual foster care or going to this place actually just outside of Chicago here called Mooseheart, 43 miles directly west. And at four years old, my family and I, including my mother, were able to go reside on what is a 1,200-acre campus. At the time, had about 400 students. And I got a, a head start, a fair start, and a jump start on what could have been a miserable situation. But just this morning, uh, I was able to be back out there on campus with the current students in an, an, in an auditorium and to tell them that part of why I still do what I do today is because of that 14 years that the men and women of the Moose gave me. Many times they did not know my name. They didn't know where I was from. They didn't know my circumstance or situation. I was just placed in their care and fortunate for me that I was. And they gave me a great both education and a cultural experience. I told the students that I can still remember in high school that as the farm communities around it were consolidating and two schools were merging, creating a new school and a new culture and a new athletic program and a new team name. That never happened, in my experience, at Mooseheart because of the 1.8 million men and women of the Moose order across the country. We got new football uniforms every other year, if we needed it or not. When the band got cut at other schools, we had band and, and uh, a phenomenal um, experience and program. When art programs got cut, we got additional supplies. And I think the lesson that I took from that is that there is a way if we can build a will. And um, I have constantly think about, uh, as now an adult running an organization, how do we build a culture of will that all kids are our kids? Now it's true, as the mayor also talked about, after coming to Washington, I mean, after coming to Chicago and living here for several years, uh, I moved on to Washington, D.C. And uh, I was working with the Children's Defense Fund, Marion Wright Edelman, and I was organizing a service project, a day of service, and happened to be building a playground. When the front page of the Washington Post had run an article about two young kids, Aisha and Clarendon, who were two and four years old. And as the mayor said, call, crawled into an abandoned car in 1996. And if anybody can remember right here in Chicago, how many people deceased because of the tremendous heat wave that we had. They had crawled into a car with dolls stacked up on the back and unfortunately suffocated and dehydrated and died. And this reporter went down to Anacostia and she kept walking in circles day after day after day. And she couldn't find a patch of green grass, she couldn't find a park, no fields, no basketball courts, and certainly no swimming pools or a playground. And in this article,
that headline, No Place to Play, she talked about, is this how we want kids to grow up? And it hit me. It hit me that my experience of many people not even knowing my name but supporting where I came from, and these two young kids not having anybody in their life to step up and make sure that no other child would live in vain the way their circumstances was. Now, I understand that that's a tragic situation and it, it, it illustrates the problem. But all of us know in our own neighborhoods, right here in Chicago, kids like that. And so at 24 years old, I doubled down and founded Kaboom to build a great place to play within walking distance of every child in America. And this year, I've been on this journey where uh, we'll celebrate our 15th birthday, our 2,000th playground. We'll have raised $200 million and our 1 millionth volunteer across the country. <laughs> and almost three years ago, as we were at 12 years old, we knew our 15th anniversary was going to be coming up, and we said, what were we going to do about it? And I decided to uh, uh, write a book. And the book chronicles my own personal experience uh, at Mooseheart and a lot more of the ins and outs about my play experience as a child. But then it goes really into you know, how we built this organization, which is really relevant to all the good work that you're doing uh, for the kids in the community here in Chicago. And the amazing people like Ray Hood, who on one of my first projects in San Antonio, Texas, was 72 years old when I met her. And she was from the west side of San Antonio, um, and a railroad track separated her all-black community from the all-white community. And they erected a 15-foot fence where the playground was so the kids from her side couldn't play on the playground anymore. And she tried to fight it and lost, but she wasn't going to stop there and somehow found us. And as an organization, we were able to go to San Antonio. And we don't just build playgrounds for people. We build playgrounds with people. There's a process around design, planning, fundraising. And then literally, in a single day, we can transform a site from a vacant lot with hundreds of volunteers to a completed playground and park that not only has slides and swings, but shade structures and art murals and other things that make it intergenerational and multi-generational so that it's so fun, everybody wants to find themselves um, spending time there. So Ray Hood uh, wanted us to come down there, participate with her project, and we did. And two things that came out of that. Number one is she said that everybody on the other side of the tracks now wanted to come back and play on their playground. <laughs> and she had the fortitude to say, that was okay and that was good. And she had to teach the community that retribution is not a form of healing, right? And that what's done for others doesn't necessarily have to be done to ourselves. 72 years old. Uh, this, just this year in February, I was in Los Angeles uh, um, and I ran into David Robinson, the NBA basketball, the admiral. Went to the Naval Academy and then played in the NBA. And he's like, I'm so glad to finally meet Mr. Kaboom. And I said, you've never been on one of our projects, or at least that I know of, how do you know Kaboom? And he went on to explain these projects that he had supported in his hometown of San Antonio. And I put the connection together. Ray Hood went on and built six more playgrounds without Daryl and without Kaboom <laughs> by herself before she passed. And David Robinson was led to believe that it wasn't this lone woman, that there had to be something else behind her. But I can attest, all there was was this, in, not enraged, but this passionate person that pursued a sense of justice. And I'm fortunate that in the 15 years that I've been able to go on this journey, those are the type of people that I met or Juanita Hatton in Philadelphia that um, worked on a playground project with Vice President Gore and Colin Powell. And a couple of weeks after the playground was inaugurated, 
went across the street as she had done every day since the park had opened. And there was graffiti on the playground. And she was angry. And she didn't know what to do. And she went back across the street and formulated a plan. She was going to call in sick from work as an hourly employee, thus giving up her days of pay, and go back and scrub the graffiti off the playground. Because as she told me, she didn't want the kids to come home that day and see graffiti on the playground that their parents and their neighbors and that volunteers had built for them. Unfortunately, that same story repeated itself several times in the next couple of months. She would walk across the street, and if there was graffiti on it, she'd call in sick, giving up her wages, and scrub the graffiti off it because she didn't want the kids to see graffiti on the playground or to let people see that it was acceptable to do. She got word out in the community that she was going to outlast them. <laughs> a couple of months ago, I had the opportunity to be in Philly and meet with Juanita and to see her playground project that looks sparkling, brand new, and hasn't been touched since in almost 13 and a half years. That's the type of work that all of us are doing. And what I loved about it, even back then, one of the things that she told me when I asked her why she did it, and she said, too many people are in this work for the credit, not the cause. And it stopped me in my tracks. And really, it makes us ask ourselves, why are we really doing this work? And are we doing this work that even without a paycheck or a headline in a newspaper, would we still be doing this work? I would contend and contest we must. We have to. And I know, having read uh, 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 many of the organizational names that are represented uh, here at this conference, and having heard about your contributions to the civil society uh, here in Chicago. And I'm grateful um, for the work that you do. What we have to do now, though, is double down a little bit more. I think again about a woman in Spartansburg, South Carolina. And this is a story that I told the mayor a while back ago that moved him. This is a story of a woman that when she was young, she was abused in a park in Spartansburg, South Carolina. Her family moved her away from the community to Atlanta. She lived with a relative. She didn't adjust well. Um, she had a tough adolescence, even tougher 20s. And one day she woke up and said, my parents molded me, my community shapes me, I'm the only person, though, that makes me. And that epiphany changed her life. She moved back to Spartansburg, South Carolina. She went back to the park that this tragic circumstance took place in and built a playground, built a park. Because just like Juanita and just like uh, uh, Ray Hood, she didn't want it to happen to any other kid. She has now gone on to lobby her city to become a playful city USA. Um, when the city went to repeal and close the rec centers in town, she formed a grassroots, non-staffed coalition to fight the closing. Kaboom could not have done that from our offices in Washington, D.C. But if we empower people to work both on our mission's behalf and, and get the credit that they deserve, our movement goes further faster. We've made some decisions that as we've to tried to scale to go from what I call one to one. For eight years, we went into communities, raised corporate dollars, matched it with community dollars, and went through a planning process that yielded a playground. At that point, the demand was greater than what we could supply. So we went to a one-to-many model. And we'd stand up in, in rooms and settings like this, and anybody who was interested in trying to build one of those parks, we would impart the knowledge that we've been able to glean from the playgrounds that we've worked on. And said, if you want to do it, 
You can go do it yourself. We can't get to every single one that's out there. And that started to yield more playgrounds. And then in the last couple of years, we've really been harnessing the use of technology, the internet, what we call it a mini-to-mini -mini approach, which is to say the way that Kaboom builds playgrounds is an interesting, unique way that works for us, but there's a lots of different ways to get a park or a playground built. Let's crowdsource the wisdom and knowledge of other people anywhere about design, fundraising, liability, whatever, online that meets people where they're at. So if you're a citizen activist or an organization or a mayor, you can learn ideas and best practices and thoughts and trials and tribulations of others to try to independently replicate what we're doing. Last year, Kaboom built 183 playgrounds in our one-to-one -one model. Last year, 600 playgrounds were built from our online community. Um, you know, and I write in the book, frankly, about the trade-offs. When you show up at a playground that you don't organize, you don't get credit for it. But if you get another playground built, do you need the credit? If somebody takes more than a day to build a playground, is that good or bad? And who's the judge of it? Does it matter? If we can get more communities engaged and involved, it takes care of some of the maintenance and programming. So it's been an interesting evolution for us to continue to both be good at the one-to-one -one and, frankly, try to scale up our impact and go deeper by taking less credit in a less visible role and enabling communities to go further faster with it and connect them with other communities so that they share their wisdom and knowledge, experience, pros and cons, pluses and minus. It doesn't matter. But it's been a fabulous experience. Um, I close on the last thing that I want to make sure that everybody walks away from this room fundamentally believing, and that is that there's a play deficit in America. And as the mayor talked about, it's doing harm to our kids. It's through play that kids build the social skills, communication with another kid, communication with adult, the muscular body development, and we all know the prevalence of childhood obesity and type 2 diabetes, coupled with the just creativity that is both necessary to have a joyous and wondrous childhood, but more importantly, to be able to adapt to the world that they're going to inherit and ultimately run. So I implore upon all of us to think about the fact that only one in five kids right now live within a half a mile to a park. Only one in five kids. 52% of elementary schools across the country have eliminated recess and PE. Kids now get on average of seven and a half hours of screen time a day. Video, TV, or monitor. And if you don't think we don't have a play deficit, uh, obviously I'm not doing my part of informing and educating you. There are solutions and we think the solutions are to do three things. Map the state of play, and the mayor has committed um, to helping us through the Chicago Park District to literally build a consumer-oriented map of all the play opportunities for kids, public and private, and what the quality is. Because once we know who's being served, who's not being served, where they're being served, and what the access for those are, we can do something about it. So next week, you'll be able to find mobile technology on our website. You'll be able to upload photos um, and ratings of any park, playground, skate park, walking trail, basketball court, athletic gymnasium. And the only way we're going to be able to do this is for all of us to do one or two. So when you're at the park, um, take a picture, upload it, and, and help us crowdsource this map of the state of play. The second thing is, we got to continue to build and improve not just more playgrounds, but better playgrounds. So the holy grail for us is can we build playgrounds that kids play harder, play longer, and want to come back more frequently? So we believe 
that there's both a need for destination parks, ones that you have to be driven to that are a lot of people at it, but also pocket parks, neighborhood parks, ones that you'll visit with much more frequency but have fewer people visiting it. And it may not even have an actual playground on it, but it could be an open space with loose parts or Tonka trucks or sand buckets or, or cardboard boxes that kids can turn into forts or spaceships. Imagine that. And then the third thing is, uh, we need all of you to be advocates for play. And I close on this story of two weeks before Hurricane Katrina. The school superintendent in New Orleans called me up and said, um, we had two issues on the agenda, school board agenda. Lunch menus and recess. 600 parents showed up to testify about the lunch menu and what we were going to serve our kids. Three parents showed up to talk about recess. And she said to me, Daryl, we cut it without any consequences. And as an educator, she was asking for help. They know the importance of the work that we're doing, but we have to show up. We have to build a critical mass and go into our school boards and to our city council meetings and make sure that the time for kids to play and the places for kids to play are on people's agendas. And if we don't have a political agenda, recess is going to continue to be eliminated across our country and the dire consequences of this play deficit when it comes to kids' lack of imagination, lack of creativity, lack of problem solving, um, and as somebody else said, it becomes a national security issue. Do you realize that almost 70 some odd percent of kids coming out of high school right now cannot qualify to go into the military because of the physical fitness exam? It's through play that kids build an intrinsic motivation, not an extrinsic reward value. So if I've done anything, I hope what I've done is to convince you to join our movement to save play for all kids. And the secondary part is, um, this is certainly not about Kaboom, the organization. This is about Kaboom, kind of, the way we think. And to help you incorporate it into what you're doing so that you can add or take away from your experience and our experience and build better systems that produce deeper results. So I thank you very much uh, for having me and our special guest here this afternoon. And I commend and congratulate you on the fine work that you're doing for the communities uh, that you serve. I do what I do because of those two kids, Aisha and Clarendon, because of growing up at Mooseheart and because of professionals like you who support kids like me when I was a youngster and kind of wayward. So I, I, continue, I will continue to do that if you'll continue to do that. Thank you very much.